claustrophobic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All that. You're watching Shelf Life. My name is Arlen Hess, and I'm here today with Paul Hartnicki, author of Rust Belt Boy, Stories of an American Childhood. Paul has written for the Boston Globe, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, NBC News, and Comedy Central. You've won a Solace Award for your travel writing, and you are a two-time James Beard nominee. James Beard Award nominee. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome back to Pittsburgh. Good to be here. It's great to be here. Always <laughs> Welcome good to be here. home. That's yeah. right. Um, this book has Rust Belt in its title, mm -hmm. but it, the subtitle is An American Childhood. Um, how can readers who are outside of the Rust Belt connect with this book? The way they have connected with it, I can tell you from the letters they've sent me, so mm. that's most factual. It seems that they connect with, um, with be, living in a place they desperately want to leave mm. in some ways, mm. and that they desperately love. And they may not recognize that love until they leave. And so I think the book kind of reflects that same push and pull with the hometown. And whether that hometown is in, I've heard from people who have said to me, thank you for writing this. This is just like growing up in Beaumont, Texas. Oh, wow. This is, so, so it's not just Rust Belt towns, but it seems like it's any town that has gone through or any place that has gone through a, a shift, a change in fortunes. Did you desperately want to leave when you were here? I didn't get that from the book. No, but I think that people kind of take that away from it. There's a certain level of, of wanting to leave and not wanting to leave. And at times it's desperate, and yeah. at times it it's disappears. I mean, had I desperately wanted to leave, I probably would have gone to college elsewhere than University of Pittsburgh. Right, yeah. So I think young people who have some sort of adventurous spirit and feel as though their hometown is holding them a little too closely, have identified with it no matter where that hometown is. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people in Pittsburgh who have left struggle to come back and historically have not been able to come back because of the economic situation. Right, right. Yeah. You're back a lot. I'm back a lot. I've always been back a lot because I have a fair amount of family yeah. here. Yeah. But I also have been back a lot because of this book has brought me back. And it's been one of the great aspects of the book. Yeah, that's wonderful. So it's also taken me back to Buffalo and Cleveland mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. other places, but also where other Rust Belt people are, mm -hmm. which is in the South. Right, Texas, because they're scattered. And the West Coast. Yeah. 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 I was born and raised in Pittsburgh, but there's information, especially in those, those first few chapters of the book, about the history mm -hmm. of um, the region and history of Ambridge that I never learned growing up. Did you know that growing up, or you learn it in school, or did you have to research that? I had to research it. Okay. Because one of the hallmarks of growing up in, in Ambridge, and I've been told this is true about other industrial towns in the Rust Belt, is that we paid little attention to the history that came before. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, as I wrote in the book, it's, it was when you're immigrants or mm -hmm. among immigrant populations, the history was their history, mm -hmm. not our history. So we walked right by it. We nodded to it. Mm -hmm. But the historically significant places that were surrounding us were sometimes never mentioned in history classes. Teachers never talked about them. Yeah. It, was, it added to this kind of accumulation of insignificance, I think, that we felt because any important history seemed to be in the textbooks mm. that came from Boston. Yeah. Did the researching of that for the book then frame your subsequent writing of the book? Yes. The, the entire, the first idea for the book, mm. I had never really intended to write a book at all. I was happy writing 2,000 word pieces for magazines and radio. And, mm -hmm. and I stepped out of a historic building once in Ambridge, mm -hmm. and uh, I had been meeting with an Australian developer mm -hmm. who had designs on doing something in my hometown. And I looked around and I realized that he was the fourth visionary to come to that plateau. Mm -hmm. That J.P. Morgan right. 
and before him, George Rapp, and before him, George Washington, had designs on this piece of land. Right. And I realized I needed to know more about that history. And then I was enthralled. I didn't know when to stop. It was fascinating history. And my first few drafts of the book had only a sprinkling of personal experience in them, personal essay, and were mostly history. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And that, is that because of the way the shorter pieces you've written in the past, your essays and uh, scripts and things were always shorter pieces? That was what you were naturally doing? No, I think I was just diving into history and mm -hmm. trying to write history as well as I could. And I gained a, a tremendous amount of respect for David McCullough, who I kept reading over and over again to try to get the idea of how to write history engagingly. Mm -hmm. And a Pittsburgher. Exactly. I That's that why well. I favored him. <laughs> <laughs> so so it were, they were longer pieces that could be sustained longer. But I found that I really, you need to be very skilled to write engaging history. And people are sort of accustomed now to narrative history. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't prepared to take liberties with history that I would have had to do mm -hmm. to construct mm -hmm. that. Besides, readers started looking at the pieces and saying they wanted more of my engagement with the place. I always like that as, as well. As a reader. So yeah. Yeah. it ended up being a memoir illustrated with history, I guess. Which is nice because sometimes we get tired of writers and we want some history. We <laughs> exactly. Want some you know, and why are they? <laughs> also, I was writing about place to a great deal. Right. Uh, 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 to a great extent. And so the place was defined by its history. Mm -hmm. So, what other challenges did you come up against writing a longer piece like this versus what you had been used to? Well, organization, Taking, making order out of the chaos. Mm -hmm. Recently, I was listening to great writer Lewis Hyde describe how he put his books together. And he kind of dumped a box of small pieces of paper mm. out on the table and described it as putting a jigsaw puzzle together, mm -hmm. making sense out of this. Mm -hmm. Essentially, I'd done the same thing. Mm -hmm. These were, you know, the book is 23, 230 pages in 23 chapters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are lots of small pieces. Right. And then it was about writing the transitions that connected the natural narrative that evolved from there. Mm. Would you read some for us? I would. Okay. I'll read from the beginning sort of the motivation that I had for writing it. Um, those who have moved away often describe feeling a push-pull with their hometowns, acknowledging a gravity that keeps them in orbit around their roots. The relationship thrives at a distance, explaining why they're there are Pittsburgh Steeler bars from Vancouver to Miami and Belfast to Shanghai. They serve as embassies and surrogates for members of what demographer James Russell calls the Berg diaspora and are the natural result of mass immigration as well as a reminder of how globalization of an industry can lead to the global pollination of a culture. Sons and daughters lucky enough to feel attached to a distinct hometown know it works its way under our skin and into our being. Pluck a hair out of my corpse a hundred years from now, and DNA evidence will show that I grew up in Ambridge, one place on Earth, starting in 1955. Biologically, I am tied to it, but that's just the beginning. Nearly all of the stories and essays set in Ambridge and Pittsburgh, but every American settlement has seen its wave of immigrants. Those waves often come and go without us recognizing their singularity, their influence, and the pattern they follow. I've written this book and these essays to acknowledge the six million boomers who moved away from the Rust Belt, from Milwaukee and Youngstown and Scranton and all the places in between, and an appreciation for the six million who stayed home and supplied the gravity, took care of the parents, the towns, and each other. I, that happens <laughs> Sorry to me about when that. I read it sometimes, <laughs> too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm someone, I'm someone who's chosen to stay. I was born here. I chose to stay here. Um, and it, the Rust Belt is changing. It's, it's very different from when you mm -hmm. wrote about it. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, what do you see happening to the Rust Belt in the future? How do you see it changing, uh, the pros and cons of staying, of leaving? It's such a dynamic place now. Mm -hmm. And this includes everywhere from from 
Buffalo to Duluth mm -hmm. and, and south. Uh, I think it's present is what is most thrilling about it and the prospect of the future. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to tell what its future will be. There are too many pieces at play. But when I look at what's going on now, mm -hmm. It's dynamic, it's thrilling, it's exciting, it's pregnant with possibilities in all of those cities, not just Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh might be the most pregnant, but <laughs> it's also giving birth to, mm. to carry that metaphor a little farther. Um, it's so exciting to come to Pittsburgh and to all those places today. And so I think if we pay attention to what we're doing day to day in government, industry, technology, education, there have been surveys that have indicated that there's a certain segment of the population that thinks 57% 57, 57 of the population are of a particular political persuasion, thinks colleges and universities are bad for America. Pittsburgh is proving that colleges and universities are fantastic for America, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're leading the way. Mm -hmm. They have been for a long time here, ever since the steel industry jobs were lost, mm -hmm. and I expect they'll continue to. And we have an exciting generation of educated and willing to work uh, young people who it's hard not to be optimistic. That's a really great note to end on. I, I agree. I think Thank it's, you. Uh, being here and uh, remaining in Pittsburgh, uh, I'm much more optimistic now than I was for a long period of time. And the people like you who have reinvested in this place, who have seen that, there's, that there are possibilities beyond what you were told when you were young. I, I have a real strong feeling for those of oh, you. That's very sweet. That's very sweet. You've been watching Shelf Life. My name is Arlen Hess. My guest today has been Paul Hurtnicki, author of Rust Belt Boy, Stories of an American Childhood. Shelf Life is a co-production uh, between PCTV 21 and City Books, located at 908 Galveston Avenue on Pittsburgh's north side. Uh, you can follow us at uh, www.citybookspgh.com or on social media at CityBooksPGH. Thanks for watching. So what did the Australian end up doing? I mean, did he actually invest in? He did. He